How many of you, with a show of hands, are working right now or plan to work in the future? Just about every last one of you. Now, how many of you want your work to offer you more than just the paycheck, but also a pathway for expressing your purpose in ways that make the world better? Still the vast majority. A pathway for expressing your purpose in ways that make the world better. We might call that approach to work a calling. And the proportion of you who raised your hands here in response to that question is probably an inflated population estimate, since you've all self-selected into attending a TEDx event. But in a national sample of American adults from all walks of life, we found that 21% said that it is mostly or totally true that they are currently searching for their calling as it applies for their, to their career. And 31% said that they are currently living a calling in their job right now. I'm privileged to be part of a now global community of scholars who are rather obsessed with better understanding what it means to approach work as a calling and what difference it makes. What we've learned is that a sense of calling is associated with a lot of benefits. People who think of their work as a calling are more confident in their career decisions, they're more satisfied and engaged in their work, they find their work more meaningful, and they put in more effort than do people with other approaches to work. Not only that, but people who think of their work as a calling report that life as a whole is more meaningful and satisfying than do people who think of their work in other ways. Now, that's not to say that it's easy to find and live your calling. I speak in part from my own experience. I very clearly remember a time in my own life when I struggled mightily to figure out what my calling was for my life and my career. It wasn't that I couldn't find anything I was interested in. It was that I was interested in lots of things. And the thought of choosing one, if that meant not choosing something else that was really appealing to me, was almost paralyzing. Now, I completely buy into the concept of multi-potentiality or multiple callings, but that doesn't help if you're getting letters from the registrar saying, you're a junior now, we've placed a hold on your records, and you can't register for classes until you declare a major. <laughs> I think what I wanted, what I longed for at that time in my life was some kind of aha moment of clarity. Maybe a Moses in the desert kind of experience with a burning bush type sign to provide me with a clear and unambiguous sense of direction. Something like what Roger Visker experienced. Roger started his career as a police officer, and by all accounts, he was outstanding at the job. At the time I met him, years ago, he was a patrol lieutenant. That was second in command in his department, and he was next in line to become chief of police. And then one morning, as he was having breakfast at his kitchen table, he heard a voice. I said, what do you mean you heard a voice? He said, Brian, all I can tell you is, I experienced it as if it were spoken into my ears. And the voice said, Roger, I want you to leave police work, and I want you to become a pastor. And here is the name of the person I want to replace you as patrol lieutenant, and here are the names of five people I want you to talk with about this transition I'm asking you to make. And just like that, the voice went away. Now, Roger was understandably shaken by this experience. He drove into work that day, walked around the department in a daze, avoiding eye contact with everyone, unable to think about anything other than what had happened that morning. He drove back home for lunch, found his wife there, and told her what had happened. I think he was hoping she would say something like, eh, maybe you got a little bit too close to the evidence from that LSD raid the other night. Instead, what she said was, if this is what we're supposed to do, we'll figure it out. Now remember, Roger was instructed to talk to five people. He didn't really know what to tell them, so he just explained what had happened and then asked, what do you think? What did he get from these five people? And I have in the table here five messengers, because that sounded kind of apocalyptic. <laughs> well, the first thing he got was a piece of advice. Read, what color is your parachute? 
If you're not familiar with What Color Is Your Parachute, it's the best-selling career self-help book of all time. The second thing he got was another piece of advice. Maybe you should take some assessments and meet with a career counselor. The third thing was still more advice. If you're considering transitioning into a pastoral role, maybe it would be wise to meet with some pastors and ask them to tell you about what the job is like. The fourth thing Roger got was all kinds of encouragement and affirmation. These were not random strangers. They were people in his life who cared about him, who wanted the best for him, who wished him well, and who offered him all kinds of support. And the fifth thing that Roger received was a network of role models. Because remarkably, all five of these people had already gone through or were currently in the middle of a career change themselves. Now, Roger's story is astounding on many levels. But one of the ways in which it's particularly amazing to me is how well what Roger got from these five people corresponds to what we know works in effective career decision-making based on research on career interventions. Some years ago, Steve Brown and colleagues from Loyola University Chicago conducted a meta-analysis, which means that they combed the research literature to find every study they could that experimentally tested a career intervention. And when I say career interventions here, I mean individual career counseling, group counseling, career development courses, online career assessment systems, these kinds of things. They were interested in understanding two things. Number one, do these things help? Do people who participate in these kinds of career interventions, do they benefit from them? And then number two, if they do help, and if some are more helpful than others, what differentiates the really effective ones from the ones that are less effective? Well, what they found was, first of all, the answer to the first question was a resounding yes. People who have career development concerns, who participate in these kinds of career interventions, have better outcomes than people who have similar concerns who don't. And the second thing they found was that, indeed, some of these interventions are more effective than others. And the ones that are especially effective tended to have some combination of five critical ingredients, another five. What were those critical ingredients? Well, the first one was written goal-setting exercises. And as it turns out, what color is your parachute is full of these kinds of written exercises. The second critical ingredient was individualized interpretation and feedback, and that's precisely what Roger received when he went to a career counselor and took some assessments. The third critical ingredient is up-to-date, accurate occupational information. And there are a variety of ways you can get this kind of information, but one of them is certainly doing informational interviews, which is exactly what Roger was doing when he was talking with these pastors about what their experience was like. The fourth critical ingredient is attention to building support from important others. And that recognizes that these kinds of decisions about your career and your life trajectory, they're best made not in a vacuum, but within a context of support, with people who care about you walking alongside you. And Roger received that from these five people, also from his family and from other friends. And finally, the fifth critical ingredient is modeling. And I don't mean supermodeling, I mean role modeling. People are wired such that when we identify with someone who's carrying out a behavior that we want to engage in, it emboldens us. It makes us feel confident that we, too, can do that behavior. And that's what Roger received from these five people. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see this kind of convergence between a story as profound as what Roger described, and what we know works from empirical research, I pay attention. Now, Roger followed through. He went to seminary. He's since pastored three churches in three different states. And he's currently on the staff of a large church in New Lenox, Illinois. But he would be the first to tell you that his experience is exceedingly rare. It's not something that the rest of us should expect or hope for. When people ask me, how should I go about discerning a calling? I tell them, be patient, but be active. And actively engage in a process of exploration that includes things 
like these five critical ingredients. If you do that, the answers you're looking for probably will start to emerge. Of course, to fully experience the benefits of work as a calling, simply discerning one isn't enough. It might be necessary, but it's not sufficient. Several recent studies have found that it's the people who feel they're currently living a calling who experience the greatest benefit in terms of their career development, their satisfaction and engagement in their work, even their physical and mental health. In fact, in one recent study, researchers from the University of South Florida found that people who felt they had discerned a calling but who weren't living it out were actually less committed, less satisfied with their work, and more anxious and depressed than were people who didn't feel they had a sense of calling at all. How, then, do you go about living a calling? Especially if the job that you're in isn't necessarily the one you would have chosen, or if the circumstances in your life are such that changing a career just isn't realistic right now. Well, you might try to approach things the way that Maggie Garza does. I first met Maggie years ago when my wife and I welcomed our third son into the world. We have four children, all boys, and when our third was born, Maggie was the environmental services technician assigned to our room in the hospital. She said, they call us environmental techs to make us sound important. We just say we work in housekeeping. Now, Maggie had a job description. It involved things like wiping down surfaces, taking out trash, cleaning floors. She did those things, and she did them really well, but she did a lot more than that. She doted on our newborn. She expressed genuine empathy and compassion toward my wife, who was still experiencing the lingering pains of childbirth. She shared with us about her life and her family. She built a relationship with us, and she made us feel like her visit to our room was the single most important thing she had to do that day. If you were to talk to the doctors and nurses who work with Maggie, they'd say, you don't even know the half of it. When they have a difficult time on the pediatrics floor with a child patient, they often call Maggie into the room to break the ice. She'll crawl around on the floor, purring like a kitten or barking like a dog, and soon the child is laughing, the parents are smiling, and the doctors and nurses can engage in delivering high-quality health care. Now, Maggie is a custodian. This is not a job that most people aspire to, but for her, it's a calling. She recognizes that she plays an important role in advancing the mission of the hospital, which is to help people heal and enhance their health. She also recognizes that she is not a passive recipient of her work experience. Rather, she is an active shaper of it. She takes care of her job duties but she goes beyond them and crafts her tasks, the relationship context, even the very meaning of the work itself. She does this in order to align her work with a broader sense of purpose that matters to her and that makes the world better. Maggie's is an example that should be recognized. And in fact, Maggie is here today. So if you see her, please tell her thank you for your example. Maggie's is also an example that should be followed. How then do you go about living a calling? I'll close with an age-old anecdote about three workers who were breaking up rocks. They were asked to describe what it was that they were doing. And the first one said, I'm making little ones out of big ones. And the second one said, I'm earning a living. And the third one said, I'm building a cathedral. What cathedral are you building when you are able to articulate and orient to the broader sense of purpose that matters to you and that makes the world better that you're carrying out through the daily activity of your work? You're experiencing what it means to live a calling. Thank you.